Good morning. Welcome to day 12. Fortunate Sun. Okay, so we just kind of hit these uh, two days ago. I did, uh, my office is under construction yesterday. It's a total mess. I couldn't write yesterday. But uh, we hit kind of the place structurally where we're going to start the third act. And of course, uh, as usual that night, was it Monday night, I had a real super anxiety attack, which is also the other word for my internal bells reaching, ringing, going four alarm fire and telling me, um, okay, now it's time to go back and thicken the branch you're on again before you start off on the third act. Um, and so this time what I'm doing, if you recall last time, um, I, I went back and I actually added the point of view of the film because I realized that uh, the point of view of the film could not be told through the protagonist, although it is the protagonist's journey because what the protagonist is doing is too extreme and too difficult for the audience to put themselves in as a vessel, to use him as a vessel, although they will uh, be cheering for what he does, uh, they can't quite be him. And so it's often, often sometimes the case that you uh, have someone else who is watching the person who uh, is our vessel for interpreting what we think about a person and what they're doing. It's a, quite a convenient um, <clears throat> thing to do. And so, and I also killed the wife off, if you recall, etc. And I thicken the branch in that manner. Um, now this time I realize we're going to come into the end game. Now, I've always knew, known, of course, that there was an antagonist, right? But I wasn't sure exactly who the antagonist was. I mean, I was sure who the antagonist was because this is a real-world problem, which is to say that of, you know, um, the securitizing of predatory loans for uh, aimed at Americans with disabilities, particularly American veterans with disabilities. This is a real problem. So it's very easy to identify who the villain is. And I've always known that. I've always known, well, I don't have to make up a villain. I know, I always knew I wasn't going to have to make up some sort of, um, some heavy, some Russian thug or Russian gangster or some Bond supervillain who wanted to cut off the world's water supply. I knew that actually they're real world villains. And the way I work when I'm making, when I'm running action films, which are by nature simple and should not be complex, is I create a ladder. And, a, and the ladder is the ladder of antagonists. The ladder of antagonists, I know that at the end of this ladder, and if we look at the industry that makes predatory loans to people with disabilities, we know who's involved. This doesn't take rocket science. We know that it's going to be politicians that are involved. We're going to know that it's bankers, underwriters, hedge fund owners. And in this case, you know, I threw in some sort of street funds to to enforce their will uh, on a local level. So that's a ladder, though, and I always start from small and go to big. And in that way, we allow the script to escalate as it goes on, but we also allow a logical ladder to um, be created that just gets bigger and bigger, and the stakes get bigger and bigger, and it becomes more and more, less and less of a local problem, and more and more of a national problem for our, our um, <clears throat> protagonist. Now, during my and massive anxiety attack, and I realized, oh my god, I know there's a bad guy, but I really don't know his actual definition and what he looks like, etc. And if I'm going to go into the third act now, I have to go back and I have to get to know him because I need to be angry at him in order to write the third act and really let this protagonist, Victor Adams, lay waste to these people and make us feel like he deserves it. Um, and I also thought simultaneously, well, oh my God, Kurt, why are you doing this to these people? I mean, this process of filming this, and by the way, many times I thought to myself, why am I doing it to myself? But I thought, well, because I, I tend to write when I write like this, I tend to write in a very global way. I'm writing all things at once, and all things are, are in my mind. It's like balls juggling. They're all in the air at the same time, which I guess is probably fairly difficult to do. So it's not the easiest way to write in some ways, but for me it is the easiest way to write these sort of simple stories. But then I realized, no, it's actually okay because you know when I print the final script for people to read, for you to read, and if you read it and you're interested and you want to go and say, well, how was that done? It's very simple because you'll be able to see the layers of paint as I lay them over one at a time 
rather than having premixed the paint and laying, laying it down, which can be quite confusing. And by the way, if you do premix the paint, sometimes it doesn't work that well because you get distracted by the granules of certain colors in the paint that aren't necessarily that important. If you'll notice, I've laid down the most important base coat first, which is the journey of the protagonist, which is quite simple. You know, this guy gets blown up, um, the Brenders gets alone, they get killed for it, blah, 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 and he goes out on this sort of mission of, of revenge or equilibrium against the people who do these things to people like him. Um, that's the most important part of the movie because that is the forward moving engine, the character driven engine of the film. That's the most important thing. Then the point of view is, you know, that's, I wouldn't even say that's the second most important thing, but it's certainly a very important thing because it helps to sort of tonally rein the film in because the tone of how the people who view him react to him, you know, movies are reactions. Um, they are, uh, there's, Far more painful than watching a, a child die is watching a mother watch a child die on film. And so by harnessing the, the reactions of how we view our and a protagonist, we can, I can to some extent direct your reactions to him as well. And that's very important. And that sets tone. You know, if they're kind of amused by him and they're amazed by him, then, you know, as opposed to disgusted by him, um, but if they're like, oh my god, who the fuck is this guy? The audience really kind of enjoys that rather than just having to do something an incredible on screen and thinking for themselves, who the fuck is this guy? Uh, if they think that. So, um, anyway, so I've laid down these very clearly gone through as I'm going, simultaneously um, going back and laying down new layers of paint over it to build it up to get to this you know, the, the antagonist, the point of view, and now the protagonist, as we showed you this morning, to get to this point, this jumping off point of the third act, where the body of the script again will be starting to come alive, it'll start, it's starting to have some texture, and I'll be ready, the, the keg of dynamite will be more loaded for me to go after these, um, these people in the third act. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to go, and I'm going to put a face on the bad guy. Now it's going to be a little tricky here because I have to figure out how to do it in such a way that the face of the bad guy is present in the movie. We need to know him. We can't just introduce him in the third act. Um, so he's present during the movie and such so that we've gotten to know him and have a quote-unquote relationship with him, but he's not evident as the bad guy. Now, of course, when you read it, you're going to know because I just told you. But if you read it clean, you probably wouldn't have known. You might have suspected, but you wouldn't know. But suspecting is okay, as long as it's not just self-evident and obvious. But I have to do it in such a way that he's not obvious because, I don't even know what that was, but it didn't sound good. Um, uh, because otherwise, if it is obvious, then it should be to us and it should be obvious to our protagonist. And if that's the case, then he doesn't climb the ladder. He just circumvents the ladder and goes to the top rung, which gives us about a 20-minute movie, right? So I have to keep him alive but, and present, um, but somewhat hidden uh, as being the, uh, the engine of all the bad things that are happening in the movie so that my character has to climb the, the ladder of the hierarchy of protagonist, antagonist in order to get to the end. And that, that ends up being a structural thing. That alone brings structure to the movie, this ladder uh, created, uh, that I often create of a hierarchy of badness that the, our character has to travel through. And he has to travel through it because he has to go, go from one step to the other to figure out who the next bad guy is. Again, we might know it a little bit earlier, or we might suspect it a little bit earlier, but he can't know it or suspect it a little bit earlier because, again, then he'll just circumvent the ladder, and thereby circumvent the structure of the film. So here we go. Why are you beeping? Okay, guys, see you soon. i got a lot to do today, so I'm not going to be writing that long, but I'll see you in a little bit.
Okay, and there you have it. So, you know, we'll we'll see when I can start going back through it again in not too long, not too many days now, whether it all works or not. But you see, if, if you were watching along, I very quickly uh, layered in the identity of the bad guy and his um, position in life, his modus operandi, who he is, what his identity is, what his tone is, and, you know, he seems like a very good guy, actually, right now. Um, but trust me, he will turn out to be the worst guy imaginable, and therefore we will hate him, and he will deserve to die. Um, but it was, uh, if you see, it's a very simple process when you go in after the fact, and knowing you've got a bad guy, I mean, you knowing there's a monster in the house, but not necessarily describing whether it has tentacles or big fangs or he's furry with claws or whatever, but knowing there's a monster in the house and then waiting to see exactly what you need out of that monster and then going back and uh, leapfrogging from stone to stone to put him in where you need him, as you need him, it, for me, it diminishes confusion because if you do it while you're writing, Sometimes you tend to go down rabbit holes that are unimportant and things get confusing and those tend to unbalance other things that you might be doing and you may or I may leave the ball. And the ball is what? The ball is the antagonist's journey. That's the most important thing. His straight line arrow through the story. And your antagonist, I believe, should have a straight line arrow through the story. It shouldn't meander and it shouldn't wander because if it does, you know, if he's going taking dead ends, I mean, that's going to hit the floor, right? So why bother with that? So you figure what that is, and then the other things are additive. Now, again, this isn't the only way to write. This is just one way to get a, an action film um, out in, in it, what it's hopefully in its kind of structuralist, very pure form, and get it done quickly, and get it done so you can wrap your arms around it, you don't spend your life writing, you know, an action film that may or may not get made. And also, let's face it, it's an action film, we'll call it Cape or Wick, and Wick, uh, I love those films, but they're not curing cancer. So, it's not necessarily worth spending, you know, your life doing it like you're writing Chinatown or something like that. So, uh, in any event, now you've seen how I've done that, and now I'm ready to start to launch into the third act. I really know who the villain is now. I really don't like him. I know who the hero is right now. I really don't like it. I know what the situation is that exists between them and the, the tension that is caused by one person's action and another person's reaction. It's all very clear. I mean, it'll get clear when I go back and go through and basically make everything actually work. Um, but the pieces are all there, and I think theoretically in the right order. And one of the nice things about going back after the fact, um, before I launch in the third act, to go in and, and color inside the shape of the monster or the antagonist that I made, is that I have a very, you have a very good sense instinctually how often, how much of him I need. So how often I need to make him appear. And, you know, you'll see it happens. He appears on TV a couple times saying his things, which obviously is very easy to win, great way to make things appear because you don't have to do a lot of setup or anything for the scenes, and you can include him by basically jumping time and space with your other protagonists. They don't have to be in the same room. That's very obvious, but, um, but it just allows me to sort of insert him when I need him, saying what I need him to say, and giving the audience what information I need to give about him to form opinions about him that may be misleading, but, um, you know, as I said earlier before the story, the audience really needs to know who the villain is before the hero gets to the villain. And uh, it's, it's really and only in that way can they have a sort of satisfying confrontation with them at the end. And, uh, Former fortunate son, fortunate son, day 12, that's all she wrote. I'll see you tomorrow, I think.